so part of the reason and uh, that I uh, uh, I was added on the program, and uh, is because I just won the breakthrough prize, and <laughs> and so and and, and it, I particularly wanted to mention this, and I, I just felt bad that I didn't have that slide to show to show you. So at the end of the pres of the ceremony, and all the awardees were lining up getting on the stage, you see ten men and me. Okay, so this is what we have to deal with. And I totally agree with you that we need more women in science. And that's really is one of my job now is to try to inspire as many women to go into science as possible. And um, I think that I'm a good example for that because I started out not knowing what I wanted to do. And my mother, you know, being an, a, a, a growing, up, growing up in a Chinese family, wanted me just, you know, to play the piano and maybe later on teach the little kids how to play piano and then get married and that, that would be it. And then I decided to go into science and then actually and my spouse was the one that really inspired me, encouraged me and tell me that I can do it, that I'm good enough and I can be as good as anybody. And I think that was really great advice from him. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is that my talk, I think you can hear me, right? I don't need a microphone because I have a boom box. They all say that I have a boom box. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about two, uh, two current topics. And the first is that, you know, um, you know the neurodegenerative disease um, and progress <coughs> and as you, and over time. So what I mean by neurodegenerative disease are Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS and FTD. And um, so what I want to do is some, uh, to tell you uh, some of the current advances and on the mechanism of how the um, neurodegenerative disease progression occur and, um, and through a mechanism, what we call cell-to-cell -cell transmission. And then the second part of my talk is that how we use this information now to come up with potential diagnosis and therapy and for these um, neurodegenerative diseases. And so as I mentioned that um, neurodegenerative diseases are ca characterized by the accumulation of uh, abnormal pathology. And in Alzheimer's disease, you can see that there's beta amyloid plaques and there's little tangle, they, they accumulate. And also in Parkinson's disease, there's blue body uh, uh, that are containing alpha synuclein um, accumulates. And then, um, so ALS and FTD um, and a different protein called TDP4 is the uh, abnormally coded. And so we actually spend a lot of time, so about 30, 40 years ago, and we decided at that time, we didn't know the molecular phase of the pathology. And so I and decided that I would work with um, and my spouse, and John Hosanowski, who's a neuropathologist. So the reason why that is an con important connection is that, you know, neurodegenerative diseases are purely human diseases. There are no animal equivalents. There are no animal models, and uh, they're all connaturally. And so, because we need to ID these proteins, so the only way we can do it is for him to work with the neurologist, convince um, the patients, and who come in with these different neurodegenerative diseases to donate their brain for research. And most people do. And in the US, and this is kind of important because in the US, um, it's not uncommon. People very, are very generous and they donate. But when you go to Asia and you go to even and parts of Europe that it may become more difficult for them to really have access to the material to work with. And um, so, so what we did was that we just took these um, and um, brain of patient with different neurodegenerative disease and then use, use biochemical methods and fractionate the brain and then eventually through sequences and so on, identify and, uh, the pathology. And um, so the second also important aspect of neurodegenerative disease, as I mentioned, is that they slowly progress, okay? And so you see here that this, this is a, a, uh, um, a diagram and uh, taken from a review, but the person who actually was responsible in doing this is a Heiko Brock, a neuropathologist. So what he did was that he took um, thousands of brains of patients with different neurodegenerative disease, and then he mapped out the pathology. He mapped out beta amyloid, he mapped out tau tangles and so on. And so he basically find that whenever there's very low pathology, let's say in Alzheimer's disease, the tau tangle are always found in the same place. So in other words, that it starts in the locus root and then they move to the limbic system. 
and then eventually move to the frontal cortex, and then finally to the rest of the brain. And so they all just have this stereotypical spreading of disease pathology. Um, as a shared mechanism, they all do the same thing differently. And, and also, the other thing that, so you, you study the neuropathology, and then you kind of see patients coming in with different clinical phenotypes. And then, lo and behold, we were very surprised to find that, you know, for um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases that have power pathology, look at this list. There's so many different uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and Alzheimer's disease being the major one because there's so many people that eventually succumb to Alzheimer's disease. But they're rarer disease that really tell us and help us, and to to you know to to confirm or to. Uh, to, to make the suggestion that tau is a gene that could actually be um, responsible for a neurodegenerative disease. And part of the reason why tau has a bad name earlier on is because Alzheimer's disease has multiple pathologies of plaques and tangles. And, that, and also because of the fact that um, tangles are found in so many different neurodegenerative diseases. And the scientists in the field were saying that, well, that's, you know, tau is not that specific. It's just a response or injury response to an insult. But this verified that it's not the case in the sense that, um, that you have a genetic mutation on the tau gene itself. It is, would be inherited autosomal-dominantly and the patient would get a disease and without fail. So that's, um, that really supports the idea that tau by itself can cause a neurodegenerative disease. And um, there are fewer uh, entity that have avacinucleine pathology, but there's quite a lot still. And there's Parkinson's disease, and there's Parkinson's disease with dementia. So basically, um, this is actually even a bigger entity and, and as Parkinson's disease. The, be the reason being that, you know, um, anyone who lives with Parkinson's disease long enough, and if they're old enough, so in other words, if they're going into the eighth decade of, of life, by and large, that 80% of them would, would suffer from some degree of dementia. And then there's another entity called dementia with Lewy body and, um, and um, Alzheimer's disease actually is the most common uh, alpha synucleinopathy because there's so many patients and that have Alzheimer's disease and about 50% of those would have varying level of Lewy body um, in the brain as a co-pathology in addition to plaques and tangles. And so, and um, other diseases that neurodegenerative disease with TDP43 pathology, it looked like very few, it looked like ALS and FTD that are the major ones, but there are multiple subtypes here. I didn't list them down, they're listing out, list them out here. So there's type one, type A, B, C, D, and U. So there are five different subtypes based on uh, the distribution of the pathology and, and also the clinical phenotype uh, as well. And again, Alzheimer's disease is the most common TTP43 proteinopathy because there's so many patients with Alzheimer's disease and, and many of these patients also and have TTP43 co-pathology. And so based on what I just told you that, um, you know, that there are multiple clinical entities and also that they spread over time, that we put towards two different hypotheses, which we call the transmission hypothesis and the strain hypothesis. The idea would be can we demonstrate this concept of what we see in patients in animal models? So in other words, that if we, if we, can we engineer in animals the phenomenon that we see in patients? And so we, we'll start with the first one. So the way we do that and was that um, we um, take a little bit of the, uh, so in this particular case, and um, this is for, for Parkinson's disease, and this, Fortunately, it was the first experiment that we did to try to see if we can induce pathology directly um, by giving them some of the uh, uh, pathology, either you know, and from uh, human neurodegenerative disease brain or that whatever th that we can try to model these pathology um, in the test tube. So here, what we can do is that we can take alpha synuclein recombinant protein. So in other words, that um, alpha synuclein we make we treat bacteria to make a lot of this protein, and then we purify it, and then we just in, we aggregate them in, in, in the test tube. So in test tube, when you aggregate them under the right condition, you actually can get them to form these amyloid fibers. And then you can take this material, and then you can inject it into brain and see and ask whether or not the material that you inject could induce pathology. And in fact, we took a lesson. So th this is 
some of this stuff. Um, so this is actually, and before I go into telling you about injecting into non-transgenic mice, so as you probably know that um, the field of, of modeling and uh, pathology have been ongoing for, for, gen for many years, for probably the last 30, 40 years. And, but the way that we um, did it in the field, it's like you know many, many other fields, that we create transgenic mice that overexpress, massively overexpress the, the disease protein, and often with the genetic mutation, so that, so that the protein would aggregate faster, so that you would see pathology in the life, lifetime of the mouse. And so, but that was very, very nice. We can do that, we, can, we don't have to inject, we can just basically let the animal, uh, animals live, and then eventually, as they age, they would develop the pathology. Um, but as you know that um, Alzheimer's disease in particular, and it's not characterized by gene duplication of the tau gene, and the Down syndrome, as you know, that have an you know, triplication of the APP gene, but there's no really no disease that will have tau duplication as a mechanism. So we thought we should make models to more rep closely represent the human condition. So we decided that we will eliminate, we will avoid overexpression, but instead, we try to basically inject some of these um, and uh, amyloid fibers into wild type mice. So as I started saying that the first experiment we did was that we generate synthetic um, alpha synuclein fibers similar to the Lewy body into a wild type mouse brain. And in fact, we decided to use mouse alpha synuclein instead of human. Why? Because we know that in prion disease, and there's species barrier. So we worry that there may be species barrier here. So we decided to just use the mouse instead of the human. So that actually position and, um, was very important because we were the first to report the, the results, which are shown in the next slide. And we were able to see pathology in this mouse by injecting just um, synthetic alpha synuclein preformed fibers. And our um, competitors and use human uh, Form fibers instead of mouse preformed fibers. And because mouse um, are so much, mouse alpha synuclein actually aggregate much better than humans. So we got to the finish line before they did. They were waiting for pathology, and we actually saw pathology you know, in, within months, within actually even weeks. And so you see that you know, 30 days after we injected the material into the, the um, uh, uh, dorsal striatum. And so the reason why we do dorsal striatum is that because in Parkinson's disease and uh, the pathology, as you know, that these neurons that make dopamine and uh, in the substantial ribotoxic factor, they selectively die and they project the striatum. So they receive things in the, the neurons in the striatum. And, um, and so we, we put the uh, seed in so that we can induce pathology and trying to see whether we can re re recapitulate what you see in Parkinson's disease. And indeed, what we found was that we found uh, pathology and in the substantial nigro pulse compactor. What you're seeing here and uh, the uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, which mark the dopaminergic neuron. So the cells that make dopamine, and they have the enzyme, tyrosine hydroxylase. And you can see that they also have this pathological aggregate, which are marked by phosphorylated forms of alpha synuclein. And so actually, it's very convenient because we have a marker. So we have an antibody to a phosphor form, and you see that in all of these mutagenic diseases, it seems that phosphorylation is one of the abnormal events that happen, and that we can use antibody made to certain select phosphorylation site as a marker for pathology. So this is just very clean. All you see are pathology. You can see the pathology increasing over time and, and post-injection. And by 180 days, six months later, you see really quite widespread pathology. And also, you see that over time, you see the pathology first, as you see in 30 days. And so now you look at um, the uh, substantial nitro stain with tyrosine hydroxylase. But over time, you see that this is at six months, you see dramatic loss of neurons, tyrosine hydroxylase, positive neuron, in the ipsilateral substantial nitro, the side where we inject versus the other side, we, which, which there's no connection between um, in a substantial nigra in the mouse and between one side of the brain to the other. So that's really convenient because we can use this side as control to compare to the side that degenerates. So you see that there's lots of neurons here. And concomitant with this loss of neurons, 
we actually were able to show that they have motoric phenotype. So you can see, for example, by rotor rod, over time after we inject, they are, you know, they have deficit over time in both of these motoric uh, tests that we gave them. But you know, because you know nothing happened to their, we didn't the, the, the threading didn't go to the hippocampus or at least at that time. So you see that they're cognitively okay, and um, even after uh, six months post um, injection. So that's great. So we can do that for for synuclein. I'm, I'm so glad that we did it. We started with synuclein because how was this so simple? So we did the same experiment. We took uh, recombinant tau protein. We get aggregated in, in test tubes. We injected this material. Tau is really kind of strange in the sense that it doesn't aggregate by itself. You have to use polyanion and to help it. And so we add heparin so that to make it fibrilized. But to our surprise and disappointment that even after two years and survival, there are maybe a couple of cells with pathology. So that's not a model that you can work with at all. So this is kind of disappointing. And so, um, so that's what I said. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so one of uh, the graduate students at the time and uh, thought of something, thought he, she was very creative. So she thought, what about if we were to just take some of the um, Alzheimer's tau and, and enrich uh, biochemically from Alzheimer's brain and inject that with that induced pathology. And you see here, lo and behold, and we were able to see pathology in these neurons in the hallux region of the hippocampus. And so this is on one side, on the ipsilateral side, but in, on the opposite side, there's still pathology. So in other words, that their pathology now, they go from one side and spread to the other side of the brain. And they also go to other brain regions as well, to the, uh, for example, memory area and enteronic cortex. And you see this over time, at three months, six months, and nine months, there's progressive spread of the pathology and pretty much kind of, you know, and recapitulating what um, uh, Brock proposed and for humans in terms of the progression of the pathology. And you see here, down here, that in these pathology also have a, um, a general property of um, um, binding to these chemical dyes called thioflavin because they have uh, beta sheet, beta sheet uh, structure that, that allow them to intercalate these, um, these dyes. And so you see that initially they form fibers first before they adopt the mature conformation that allow them to be detected by these amyl binding dyes. And so, so, um, so uh, what we did then did after we injected them and watched over time uh, the spreading and we can map the pathology in, uh, in the brain and just by quantifying the amount of uh, uh, cells that have uh, uh, these inclusions. And you can see that basically, uh, the reason why we wanted to do this is that we wanted to try to understand how the pathology spread in brain. And as you probably know that, um, that um, there are a couple of, uh, um, uh, um, actually what, um, Microsoft, and they funded um, what these people in, in wealthy people in Seattle, they funded efforts to try to construct the human and uh, <coughs> neuroanatomical connectome and the mouse neuroanatomical connectome. And so this is based on the mouse neuroanatomical connectome. So if you put something in the dorsal striatum at dorsal hippocampus, then these are the area where they talk to. And so you can see that they, they have a reciprocal connection for example, with the ventral, ventral hippocampus and also with locus cerulis. So basically what we inject in the locus cerulis, then it would go to the hippocampus. We inject in the hippo hippocampus, they would go to the uh, locus cerulis. So basically what, when we map all of this and using and these and uh, Allen Brain Atlas for the mouse, and what we found was that many of the region that is connected to the dorsal hippocampus indeed develop pathology. And there are a few regions that, uh, that don't. Um, so, and, but I think that we, if we waited long enough, and in fact we did, and that we saw pathology in the visual cortex and, um, and a little bit in the thalamus uh, as well. So, um, so they do spread according to the neuroanatomical connectome. So what about TDP? I mentioned that we, our lab worked on um, uh, uh, tau and synuclein, and then we discovered TDP in 2006. And so, um, so we knew that TDP 
would be problematic because unlike pounds and nucleins, uh, which are really cytoplasmic protein, and, and the function is it's sort of it's still today, unfortunately, is ill-defined. But these two molecules, despite the fact that they, they, there are a lot of it in the brain, if you knock out tau, you knock out cytonucleus, the mouse is fine. But if you knock out TDP, which is an ion rebinding protein, you have a dead mouse. So basically, our approach and to making animal model of um, TDP43 would be quite different. So right on the get-go, once we know that this protein is a non-A binding protein, I wanted to use an inducible system so that I would be able to express um, TDP-43 in the mice. And particularly also that the, you know, the, the pathology and of ALS-FTD that accumulate TDP-43, although TDP-43 is mostly normally in the, in the nucleus, but the pathology is in um, the cytoplasm. So that's why we kind of direct the expression of the chain gene to the cytoplasm. So basically, you know, when we induce by adding doxycycline to the mice, inject it into the mice, and then turn on uh, the expression, then we have um, cytoplasmic expression of TDP43, and this is what it looks like. So you can see that, you know, and this is non-transgenic, basically both the human and, um, um, and the mouse TDP um, so this 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 mouse express human TDP. So, but then this endogenous mouse TD, uh, TDP as well. So basically, you can see expression of TDP um, in the hippocampus. Um, and then and, and then they don't really de develop aggregates. They develop very low level number of aggregates. And so um, so this is really not quite a model in the sense that. Um, the lifespan is not affected. There's no pathology, and one of the first thing we want to do is to to see whether we can see develop the pathology. And so, so what we decided to do then is to um, so this is just a, the mouse model itself. But we took this mouse model. Now we injected a little bit of TDP43 pathology, isolated from human patient uh, brain with um, uh, the suffer from FTLD TDP. And you can see that at one month, and after injecting this extract into the chemkinase 2 TDP43 NLS mice, you see cells now accumulating phospho TDP43 pathology and in the cortex and also in the hippocampus, and both in the ipsilateral side and also in the chondroitin side as well. So which means that we're successful in developing pathology in this mouse model. And they also, over time, spread um, as well. And over time, you see that this is a region. Um, and uh, uh, so there's white matter tracks that are also, the fornex, for example, are labeled as well. So the, the axons in the TDP43, and maybe even the glial cells, and uh, are, are developing some of the pathology and of TDP43 in this mouse model. So the summary of this part, part of my talk is that um, um, I showed you that alpha cytonucleins can form fibers, and they can convert endogenous alpha cytonuclein and then accumulate as Lewy body and Lewy neuron inclusion and, um, in animal models. And um, I also showed you that this pathology drive the selective loss of substantial nigra and uh, pose uh, a dopaminergic neuron and resulting in behavior deficit similar to that in human TB. So this is quite important, and uh, it, as you can, as I showed you, that you know, despite the fact that the pathology in, in, are in many different parts of the brain, and dopaminergic neurons are selectively degenerate, that's because by making dopamine, they're already under a lot of oxidative stress, and so you kind of push them over a little bit, and they, they, then they die earlier than the other cells. And um, so AD tau, uh, but not synthetic tau fibers can induce neutrophil like pathology in wild type mice. And then finally, FDLD, TDP, enriched lysate can induce the formation and propagation of TDP43 in TDP4 transgenic mice. So, so this is the, um, the uh, uh, two slides is summarizing this part of my talk. So I think that it depends on, on, on whether I have time or not. If I don't have time, I can stop after these two slides and I'll show you what I mean, what I, all, everything that I just said in terms of cell to cell transmission. So basically, we show that um, tau and nucleus and TDP can undergo cell to cell transmission. And this is really a schematic to show you 
and, and what happened and then what we can do utilizing this information. So, so basically you have the misfolded protein in an affected cell and then um, so for the transmission to occur and then that's, that misfolded protein has to get out of the cell and it has to be um, internalized by a healthy cell. And then once it gets inside, it would corrupt the endogenous protein. They adopt a bad conformation. And then, um, so basically, you can different, have different ways to try to come up with therapy by blocking the release of this misfolded protein. So if you block the release, it doesn't go out and cannot go into a, an, an affected cell. You can block the uptake of the bad protein into uh, the healthy cell as well. And you can also, and promote degradation. And so, so basically, this is what I have for transmission. So if the time is running out, I can go straight to the end, okay? And um, so basically, what we have done is to use all that information and the mouse model to come up with ways and doing, doing immunotherapy, anti-sense technology, and small, mo small molecule <coughs> drugs. And all of these are ongoing in the lab. And um, so, um, so I will stop. So this is, for example, some of the data where we use genetics. So basically, somebody earlier talked about GWAS. And so obviously, many people have done GWAS, RNA sequencing on Alzheimer's brain. And one of the gene um, that came out of an early screen with this gene called MSOC2, when you knock it out, and then you inject um, these fibers into the knockout mouse, actually, the, the, there's dramatic reduction, as you can see, of the pathology, and suggesting that this gene is part of the risk factor and uh, for, to, for, for, for modulating pathology. And then this is another risk factor, TREM2. Same thing, if you knock it out, you actually here you see more pathology. And because of mutant, too, you see more pathology. So yeah, so basically, this is the conclusion of what I intended to show you, which basically is the aggregates and from patient's brain and with new degenerative disease can induce progressive cell-to-cell -cell spread and, uh, of diseased protein in wild-type mice that would capitulate the human disease counterpart. And then these uh, findings provide novel insight into the pathogenesis of these diseases and then identify new targets for future therapy, including combination therapy. So as you know, that and the Alzheimer's disease has so many different pathology. It's unlikely that one um, antibody or one type of therapy would be able to, one therapy could cure the disease. So, so people, and particularly pharmaceutical companies, now even pharmaceutical companies are thinking about combination therapy and to eliminate the pathology. And then, um, so I showed you the transmission of these proteins represent a common me mechanism of disease progression and pathogenesis in new degenerative disease. And these are the first author of, of, of the work that I described and these are the people that support it, and this is our funding. And I, I, I do the work in collaboration with John Cincinnati. Okay. <laughs>